I'd like to call the March 22nd Board of Education meeting to order. Uh, has everybody had a chance to review the agenda? And have a motion to approve it. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. At the beginning of every meeting, we open up an opportunity for the public to come speak with the Board of Education, share their views with us, and uh, we open, openly welcome that opportunity at this time. We'll also do the same at the end of the meeting. Is there anybody from the public that would like to come speak? Okay, I'd also like to remind folks that they can contact us at any time at the Board of Ed uh, email address and uh, forward us their questions, and we'd be happy to respond to those. Um, has everybody had a chance to look at the consent agenda? And I have a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. With that, we have officially approved the Miller Driscoll Statement of Requirements. Karen, thank you very much You're for here. all of your work <laughs> on that. <laughs> My pleasure. You will forward that on to yes. Brennan? Yes. I will forward that on to the, select, the first selection this evening. Uh, and we'll anxiously await their next step. When you do, please um, include an offer that if they would like to meet and have any questions about anything, I'd be happy to sit down with Bill or Malcolm or any of the members of the Council of Public Facilities. Wonderful. I, I will do that. Thank you. Um, I only have a couple of brief comments uh, this evening. I want to remind everybody that next Monday evening at the Middlebrook Auditorium, we have a town meeting uh, to discuss the Board of Ed's budget. It starts at 7.30 p.m., and that's in the Middlebrook Auditorium. Additionally, on the 29th, we have the Tech Expo, which is also at Middlebrook. It is at 5.30 p.m. I encourage anybody that's questioning anything that we're doing relative to technology in the district to attend that. I've attended uh, the previous ones and I talk about an exciting opportunity to, uh, to see and hear not only from our, our faculty and staff, but even more importantly from our kids on, uh, on what we're doing with technology. And then the last point uh, I'd like to make, as, as you know, at our last board meeting, we, we uh, I'll say <laughs> somewhat uh, begrudgingly accepted the, uh, the resignation of our Director of Human Resources. While we're very happy for her, we're sad for ourselves, but we have already convened a search committee. Uh, it met first today. And uh, that is being co-chaired by Principal Harris and Ken Post. Uh, we're, we're anxiously uh, looking forward to trying to fill the shoes that are, that are going to be left empty. So thank you very much. Superintendent. Thank you. Um, several uh, exciting developments in the district uh, um, at each school, really. Uh, at Cider Mill, uh, uh, Jenny and her staff report that uh, their fourth graders next week are going to Ambler Farm for a culminating unit on their electricity uh, that are affiliated with their, uh, are related to their electricity unit. Students are going to be building projects uh, that are designed by the Eli Whitney Museum, uh, an electromagnet and an electric house. And uh, the real exciting, one of the exciting things about going to Ambler Farm is the proximity of it means that there's less time away from class. You don't have the travel time that formerly was taken going to the I. Whitney Museum. Uh, they're fort we're fortunate that they will be able to build these projects in the beautifully renovated carriage barn at Ambler Farm uh, with custom workbenches built to accommodate our students. Uh, the materials for the workbenches were donated. Uh, by Rings and Lumber, and the benches were built by David Lynch of wood Woodworking. So it's really nice we got some community, again, uh, examples of community uh, um, merchants uh, uh, supporting our schools. Uh, Science Fair, uh, Julia reports that uh, 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 actually it came from Ann McCann and Victoria Madden, who are co-chairs of the Middlebrook Science Fair, and uh, were reported that the Connecticut State Science Fair was held last week. And we're pleased to report two of our students, Kevin Moya and uh, Mich I hope it's Michelle Nana, placed in the competition. Uh, Michelle won Dominion's Millstone Power Station Physical Sciences Award and was named a finalist in the Physical Sciences 8th grade category. Uh, also, uh, Michelle also won the Astronomical Society of Greater Hartford Award. Uh, Michelle's project was, this is the 8th grader, Material density versus angle of refraction. So I'll have to talk to our science people and find out what that means. <laughs> Can I Google that? <laughs> um, Kevin Moya uh, won the Dominion's Millstone Power Station Physical Science Award and second place in Physical Science's seventh grade. 
Uh, he also took home the Clean Energy Finance and Investment Authority Alternative Renewable Energy Award. These are long, the awards are longer than the project. Um, and Kevin's going to go on to compete in the Broadcom Masters National Invitation uh, Competition for Middle Schools in Washington, D.C. His project was improving the efficiency of solar energy. A third student at Middlebrook, uh, Jessica Kopsa, uh, Kopsa, earned second place honors for her project in life science called the Great Plains of Change. Finally, Alex Caparata, also an eighth grader, earned third honors for his project in life science entitled The Power of Suggestion, Flavor, um, which works for me. Um, Hagen Das, all of them. Uh, our congratulations to each of these budding scientists. So it's, I think it's such a tribute to our, our science program and the parents who supported us uh, that our, our kids are really actively doing authentic science research work. Uh, and uh, who, we're looking forward to seeing uh, the eighth graders here at the high school next year. Um, had the pleasure yesterday of, of uh, meeting with 65 parent volunteers uh, at Middlebrook who shared information about careers. Uh, with our students. Uh, a huge array of careers uh, was represented in this group, including business, medicine, science-related. One parent, speaking of flavors, works as a flavor scientist. I thought that was fascinating, and Julie was sharing uh, one of the products that he's working on. Um, television production, off, we had a producer from ESPN, um, engineers, pilots, software developers, physicians, uh, veterinarians, uh, business people, uh, lawyers. Um, it was it was remarkable, uh, and we want to thank uh, our Wilton Education Foundation and our counseling office at Middlebrook, uh, the WEF volunteers, Amy Collins, Renee Cahill, and Trish Weber, and our terrific guidance team at Middlebrook, uh, Bill Gerundo, Ann McManus, and Bonnie O'Brien, who helped coordinate. It's quite a, a logistical feat when you have 65 um, people, uh, and I was really impressed with these people, most of whom were parents were willing to give uh, their valuable time. One, one of the doctors was there, and she looked like she'd just come out of the OR uh, <laughs> in her blue scrubs, uh, uh, who had raced down from Yale New Haven to, to uh, be there for us and, uh, and our kids. And as I went around to the classes, I went to several of them just to kind of pop my head in and listen for a little bit. Each of the, the parents was using the opportunity to help kids make the connection between what happens in class with um, and what they study with, with careers. And I, I thought that was a terrific connection for kids. And even though they're eighth graders, we, it gives them some understanding of why we do what we, have them do what they do and why it's important to uh, master the skills. Every one of the presenters, too, was talking about the other skills that I know that they really work on at, uh, at all levels, but at Middlebrook I know in terms of being responsible and being organized and planning and working with others. And, and they really brought that together in terrific, uh, wonderful ways. Also, there was a former NFL football player, and it was very cool to be <laughs> total groupie. I, I went there, and, and all the female faculty members who were outside the room were laughing because Jory and I were pushing each other out of the way to get in to talk to this gentleman. <laughs> so, uh, he was very gracious with our, our, our probably naive questions. It was a wonderful day. Finally, uh, at the high school, several recognitions. Uh, World Language would like to congratulate seven of our students for results on the German national exam. Each year, as you know, they are, students compete in uh, various language competitions. They'll be honored with other students in Connecticut in May at Fairfield. Harrison Bale, Casey Chase, Eric Saipanoff, uh, Lally Carmichael, Joseph Blake, Catherine Bartek, and Derek Stang. Um, the math team at Wilton High finished its regular season was invited to Connecticut State <coughs> meet uh, at E.O. Smith High School in Stores based on the performance of our students. The Model Congress Club is going to Columbia uh, Model Congress uh, this Sunday at Columbia University. Uh, the debate team, and I, I've talked to people, and I've, uh, I've got to get out and see these, these young people. They had really terrific results on Saturday at the final uh, event of the season. Uh, we have two top varsity teams. Uh, first place varsity team, Simon Brewer and Eleanor Clifford. Simon has been here before speaking to the board. Second place varsity team, Peter Jensen, Jacob Saltzman. Second place varsity speaker, Peter Jensen. Third place varsity speaker, Simon Brewer again. Uh, he qualified for states and Kurt Rubin and Price Figarelli Reed. Um, the debate team is preparing for the state finals, which I'm told will be here next week. 
correct, Bob? Uh, is it Saturday? I think next it's Saturday. Saturday. Uh, and it's a, uh, <coughs> I'd like to know more about it because I hopefully we can stop in and see some of our debaters. So, a lot going on. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, committee reports. Anybody have anything to report at this yes. point? One thing, yeah. Wonderful. The Retirement Trust and OPEB met. I know everyone's very excited about that. Together, <laughs> together with the uh, Investment Committee, and we did receive a uh, uh, portfolio fiduciary review, a diagnostic review, and we made uh, slight changes to the um, Retirement Trust and the OPEB uh, uh, plans. Wonderful. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. At this point, we, we have policy 6210, Continuing Education, uh, on the docket uh, with Mr. Canty. <clears throat> you have 10 minutes. <laughs> that probably will happen. I'll not be talking. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce to the board Dolores Tufariello who is our Continuing Education Coordinator. Uh, just in the way of introductory remarks, just want to extend my gratitude and uh, recognition for the work that Dolores does in overseeing this all-important program here at the Wilton Public Schools. It's, it's really amazing work. And we look forward to your spring report, which is upcoming, That's where fine. you'll update the board on the progress of the program. But tonight our charge is, as part of our process to update our board policies, we, we have asked Dolores to look at policy 6210. It's been nine years, actually, since this policy has been reviewed by the board, and uh, it, we felt it important to make sure that the uh, policy and regulations match our practice. Uh, before I turn it over, I just also wanted to acknowledge the work of Emily Dowden, and Susan Alstrom, who serve as part of the leadership team for the Continuing Ed program, and they do a wonderful job as well. Dolores. Well, thank you, Tim. And it's good to see everyone again tonight. And we'll see you again with the updates to our program April 26th. <coughs> uh, basically, uh, Tim really said it all. We just took, we being the administrative staff, including myself, took a straightforward approach and <coughs> read the uh, policy as it existed and compared it to the current operation. Uh, we made uh, amendations, uh, revisions as needed, and um, updated the language. Uh, extensive work had been done in the student section uh, because it had been nine years. That student section uh, was expanded to include the enrichment activities. Uh, that's basically it, really. Uh, the language is, uh, we thought, clear and uh, conveyed the uh, policy of Boards of Continuing Education. And I'd like to open it up to questions, really. Anybody have any questions? You, oh. <laughs> you talk about um, an ED245 program and mandated programs. Yeah, what, what are, <laughs> oh, is what that, are those? Oh, that, is that the, uh, on the summary page, mm -hmm. is that the, uh, the mandated programs by the state? Well, that would be citizenship and um, English as a sec second language. Let me see, and uh, let me see if there's anything else. And um, let's see, oh, and uh, adult basic education, general education development, that's the GED, English uh, as a second language and American citizenship. Okay. Now, we do not uh, do these programs here in Wilton. But we do have a grant, and uh, in, we work in collaboration with uh, Westport Public Schools. So those programs are done at the, that school in Westport. All of the mandated programs? Are yes, done. absolutely. Are there any requirements for the teachers to go through some kind of background check? Uh, the background check that we do presently mostly or I would say uh, for the students, the young students, K through, or let's just say ages up to and including 18, would be a fingerprinting. They have to be fingerprinted for them to work with the young students, not for the adult students. No, right. I noticed that you're no longer going to make the brochure available to Wilton residents in advance. Um, I'm just wondering why, and if that's consistent with what's being done in other towns. Um, I have not compared it to other towns. 
But what we did was, uh, with the website uh, being offered, uh, you know, from 2009, I believe, we went online, we put that out there two weeks ahead of the brochure. It's really a part of a plan, and I'll address your question, to have uh, this demographic rely more on the online information uh, so we can slowly wean them off the hard copy because my goal really is to reduce that booklet um, and this year I'll reduce it again another four pages to cut the expense of it. Why we don't put that brochure out two weeks ahead is because the online version is out two weeks ahead of the brochure going out and then we send out an e-blast to the database. Uh, but what we did was we did compare that over the last couple of years to see if the percentage of Wilton residents as a result of not sending that out a week early, mm -hmm. if that was affected in any way, and it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. Is there anything you'd like to add relative to what's <coughs> coming up while you have the floor, your charter, anything else? Well, we'd love to make those highlights in April, and we're looking <laughs> forward to it. But as far as the policy goes, I, I think it's um, uh, clear. Wonderful. We always uh, enjoy your updates, so we look forward to that. Thank you. We look forward to Thank seeing you, you again. So Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We now have on the agenda the 2010-11 Strategic Schools Profile. Mm -hmm. It's up for review and discussed by yourself and your principal. Each year, by law, um, school districts around Connecticut, schools around Connecticut, are required to compile data on a variety of topics. Um, the data are assembled by the state and ultimately published as uh, in something a document called Strategic Connecticut Strategic School Profiles. These profiles for the public's interest are, are, on, are available online uh, and uh, the data that is presented in the, the uh, profiles uh, covers several categories. And again, this is this, these categories have not changed in the last several years, so this is the same litany of, of categories. They, they feature, as you saw, indicators of educational need, uh, program and instruction, average class size, library and computers, school staffing, school diversity, efforts to reduce racial, ethnic, and economic isolation, student performance and behavior, um, school improvement plans and activities, and supplemental information. Um, the profile breaks down the data uh, by, by district and by school, um, and uh, also shows how we compare in various categories, not all with uh, the state and with our demographic reference group, DRGA. Um, one difficulty uh, with this report, as I've said in past years, is that uh, the information's a year old or more. And for example, the testing results are the testing results from a year ago. And here we've had the, the board uh, uh, presentation um, back in the, in the fall on our, our, our data. So it, it's old information. Um, the a second fact is that the financial data in the report is, is uh, from 2009-10. So again, it, it's just not timely. Um, we were supposed to receive this report in November, and, and last year we got it in March. This year they improved. We got it in February. Uh, one final point on it is that we, the superintendents have been meeting uh, with the, the commissioner, and one of the issues that has come up is the, the dissatisfaction with this this data in the sense that in 2012 we ought to be able to have some kind of data collection system that has more real-time data that would be more valuable to boards to administrators uh, and we're hopeful that, that there'll be some change in, in this uh, um, because I, I think it as, as it's currently constituted is, is not helpful it's a good source historically to look at, at data but for, for operational and future decision making, it's not, not particularly valuable for, to us. So, having said that, um, we've fulfilled our legal responsibility to uh, um, present at the stage that says, you know, you must share this with your board. And um, I know our, our board takes the time to read this and look at it, and we're happy to answer any questions you might have about it. Okay. 
Yeah, I just don't find it to be a particularly useful document two years after. Well, and the census data is 10 years old. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, it's a great deal. <laughs> I wonder if they made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. 2000. Yep, yeah. yeah. 2000. <clears throat> It's, it, it just doesn't make sense. It's, I'm, I'm <laughs> relieved to hear you say that you because really as a new Harry? board member, I started going through it and was like, what am I missing here? This right. like <laughs> incredible amount of work went into this document that, but no, I didn't mean that. But <laughs> well, let me just say one thing though. For the, over the last two years, I've had six calls from prospective parents wanting to look into moving to Wilton and somehow they tracked me down and got my name and I ended up getting an email, and then I called them back, and everyone read that. So it is being read. It's um, and they had asked some very good questions, and I would say, questions they asked were about the transition because of the number of schools we have. They asked about special education. It was fascinating. They asked about where the areas of emphasis and some things that we did and didn't do. Not one mentioned taxes. Wow. It was interesting. Not one mentioned taxes. They were all interested in very detailed questions about the school district. Um, and I hope they all came. <laughs> Moved to, move to London. But, but it, even, if, even though it is old, it is read by, uh, by parents looking, considering Wilton as a place to move to. Well, thank you. Sorry, anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to see you closer. <laughs> Next on the agenda is a review of the three year technology plan being presented by Mr. Canty and Mr. Huff. Yes. Just be, can I ask one question? When we refer to CMTs as third generation and fourth generation, mm -hmm. what does that mean? The, the test has gone through several iterations, or they, they call them generations. There was the, the first test that came out in the 90s. I, I think. Listening comprehension of the tape. Yeah, you know, it was like 94, 95 right, right. I, when I first came to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And then several years later, there was a second generation. And, and there's the, the, the reason they, they point that out is that it's... Um, not to I defer to Tim and the testing people more, but it, it's difficult sometimes to make comparisons between the generations because the tests evolved and changed and the wow. content okay. changed. And so they, they, they want to make sure it's they're identifying which generation <coughs> they're talking about. Thank so that's, that's what that means. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Matthew Hepper to the board. Uh, as you know, Matt has presented on numerous occasions on our technology program. Before we get into the presentation of the three-year plan, I just wanted to commend Mr. Hepfer for his work a week ago yesterday in orchestrating a board workshop where the focus was on a wide range of web-based applications that have become fabric of uh, the, part of the fabric of our work here to support our students uh, in terms of their uh, organization, the, the ability that uh, we try to do to support their uh, um, ability to access information as it relates to performance data, attendance data, uh, the extent to which uh, we're working also as a faculty to support our curriculum mapping process and our student performance data tracking. It was really, I hope the board appreciated the workshop. Uh, what, what was most impressive was the reporting of our students here from yes. Milton High School. <laughs> it was great. Uh, it, it's uh, always good to have students on board because people really tend to listen. <laughs> so, uh, Matt, thank you for your work in, in orchestrating the workshop. It was thank you for excellent. Us. Tonight, uh, it's our obligation to present to you the uh, technology plan uh, coming up here for the next three years. It's that part of the cycle. And I know Matt's going to take you through the process, talk to you a bit about the structure of the report, and give you some uh, summary statements about how technology may evolve here over the course of the next three years that might make uh, that might look a bit different than where we are at present. Matt. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank the, the board chair for reminding the public that on March 29th, at <laughs> 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 Brook School. Um, you did say that was March 29th at 5.30? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, actually, before I begin, I, I wanted to um, thank and acknowledge all the hands that went into this document because this is really a labor of many hands. Um, the Technology Advisory Committee, 
Um, we had the district technology staff members, the district data team, uh, the staff development instructional leader, our webmasters, our administrators, teachers, students, all dedicated <coughs> time to help create this document. So as you saw when you saw the list of our committee, uh, we actually got a nice compliment from our RESC review that we had probably the most comprehensive committee they had seen so far. So I just wanted to acknowledge the work of everybody because they volunteered their time. I, you know, I call these meetings and I know I'm probably not very popular when I do, and, but they, they came and they really dedicated themselves to the work, so I really appreciate it. Uh, as Tim said, I'm going to go through process, just the uh, outline of the structure of the plan, and kind of a little bit about our philosophy of what we were, as we were building the plan, what our philosophy was, and then I'll just take your questions. So I'm going to try and be brief. Mr. Post will probably laugh. Um, <laughs> for pro for the process started in September when the state finally sent us their template. They had gone through a little bit of overturn with the tech director position, which is now vacant. So it came to us a little late. Um, we then immediately had our first technology advisory committee meeting in September, and even though it was kind of fresh on the table, we, we brought it to the technology advisory committee uh, because we knew we'd be working on it all year, and we, we decided to start crafting the vision statement. We thought that was an appropriate place to start, and it led to a real interesting and rich discussion at that first meeting. The next technology advisory committee, we really got into the weeds of, of brainstorming what some broad goals would be for each of the five goal areas. Um, and then we broke into getting into um, hearing from the students and teachers. So what one thing that we did that was different from previous uh, our previous three-year plan, before we just heard from the students, this year we decided to also hear from the teachers because we really invested a lot of time in staff development and a lot of new initiatives, and we wanted to hear the teachers' input. Um, we also put put the some of the goals in front of specific groups like the staff development instructional leader, and she put it in front of some other members of the staff development committee, and the district data team um, for some of their input on some of the goals. And then we convened um, everyone back in January and February for the actual formal writing of the document. And we used um, Dropbox, any of you with the, an iPad will love Dropbox. Um, so we were able to put all of our data that we had collected as we're putting this and the template and we all could work on the same document and see the, the same documents. And once it was uh, written, we just, uh, as it was in the Dropbox, we just kept sharing it with people. People would open it up, make the comments, make the changes. We put it to the administrators in February. At the end of February, we sent it to Dr. Richards for his signage, and then we sent it off to our RESC for their approval. And I'm happy to say that on the 15th of March, our RESC signed off on it. So really the next step for us before we send it to the state is to have the, the board approval. Um, in terms of the structure, it's really broken up into two kind of broad sections. The first section really is where you're collecting data and doing needs assessment and doing sort of a self-analysis. And then the whole second part is the plan. It's your, the, the five broad goals. The first part, really, they didn't change from the previous two iterations of the three-year plan. None of the, those sections, really, there's no changing uh, almost word for word what it was before. Um, as we were going through that work, though, however, it was very valuable to the team because we got to see, review what we did on our last three-year plan and note the progress that we had made um, in a lot of areas. And we also were <coughs> able to look at the vision statement and we determined that we, we didn't like what we had and we thought we, our goal was to kind of make it down to a, a two or three sentence vision statement. And where we ended up landing, curiously, was at the strategic plan because the language there was so concise and really brought together really what we all <coughs> believed. So we took a, a piece from our old mission statement and a piece from the language from the strategic plan and that was kind of where we landed. Um, the second part were the goals. Uh, the new state track director, who only was on the job for a few months, 
um, what he did was align the goals with the state, the, the state goals with the National Technology Plan, which you probably saw in the template. And that was really, since um, the purpose of the plan is to sit in Hartford in case someone gets audited for their federal funding, it has to be in alignment with this National Technology Plan. So that seemed to be a sensible approach. In terms of philosophy, as the, the group convened to do the writing, we decided, we, before we even started, we decided we're going to make sure we engage all the stakeholders and we're going to be good listeners, that it was important that um, no matter what the student said or the teacher said, no matter how painful it was to hear, we needed to be good listeners, and that would really inform us as we move forward. We wanted to make sure that we aligned our work with the strategic plan. We felt that it was important that, that this, our work supports the strategic plan, and we wanted to simplify you know, everyone lo falls in love with their words. I, I am guilty of this. <laughs> we wanted to try and make it simple. And the last thing, and this was a, a mantra that was very important to us, was that we're going to strive for the ideal and avoid hand wringing. That it's very easy if you look at our old three year tech plan to say, oh, well, you know, our budget got cut and we couldn't afford it. And we said, no, we're going to strive for the ideal that what your plan and your vision should be is what it should be, and you shouldn't really sit back and say, well, we may not have the money for that. We, should, we decided that from the get-go we were going to plan for what was the ideal, um, and that was, that was really what drove our work. So in conclusion, <laughs> um, I really wanted to highlight kind of three elements of the plan that really target how we're planning for the future. The first... Um, not, not really surprising at all, is to continue and really complete the idea of having wireless throughout the schools. The idea of having students have anytime access to information is so critical. It's such a skill in the 21st century when we're trying to develop problem, creative problem-solving skills and creativity. The students are going to need that access to the information. Even if our teachers aren't ready for it right now, we need to, the kids are ready. We need to come along with them. Um, a second piece is to continue to develop the, the work we're doing with our data team because as we start building this 21st century model for learning and this rigorous problem-solving, collaboration, creativity, uh, communication-centered work, we need to have a way of measuring that work. And our data team and the work that we do with the, the technology that supports the data team is going to be critical to that. And the, 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 the last piece kind of fits in with the data team is the idea of preparing for the new assessment models, both um, the formal, you know, the, the, the state assessment, whatever that ends up looking like, which is going to be um, an adaptive assessment, but even other electronic assessments. You know, we're going to be having to revamp our language arts program and our math program to meet the new state standards. And we're going to want to make sure that we have real current cutting edge assessment. <coughs> so now it's time for me to answer your questions. Wonderful. If, if you could, before questions start, uh, for those folks who have not been involved with it or didn't see the workshop last week, can you expand a little bit uh, for those watching at home what the data team is and what work they're doing is and why it's important to the members? of our community. Okay, I'll, Mr. Cantu will, is integrally involved, so I'll let him chime in too. The, the district data team it is um, the team that formed a year and a half ago um, as part of our, initially as part of our SRBI process, that you need to, um, because of the way the state writes SRBI, you need to con collect data and intervene when students, when the data shows you that students aren't learning, and then you need to prove that your interventions are creating a, a change in their learning, or if it's not, then you need to intervene again. So that was how it started. Um, we uh, invested in a, a, a tool that allows us to collect the data much more efficiently and allows us um, very seamlessly without, um, you know, it's very intuitive, so it doesn't involve a lot of professional development. Teachers can see data on student performance in many different layers, many different ways, different ways of compare, comparing students and their progress. Wonderful. Thank you. 
Anything to add? Well, I just would add that the instructional focus of the work initially, as Matt suggested, was around the SRBI process. And uh, we've, I think, done a nice job. Uh, SRBI stands for? Uh, scientific <laughs> Research-Based Interventions. The extent to which you analyze student performance data to identify <coughs> students that uh, would require an intervention that would support their learning experience and then monitor the success of that intervention. Thank you. The, the work this, this year has evolved to focus on literacy. And in fact, we've, uh, in, in addition to the uh, range of assistant principals <coughs> who serve on the team, we've actually included our reading specialists uh, and, and Matt this year uh, to try to have a focused conversation around the extent to which we're supporting student reading K-12. In the future, we hope to use the data team process actually uh, in, in a way, in a manner in which the SRBI process is infrastructural, is assumed. What we'd really like to focus the data team process on, uh, on our, our, uh, an analysis of the development of skills that most of our Wilton students uh, need to develop. And as Matt alluded to earlier, this is a real focus on critical thinking, problem solving, problem-based learning so that uh, we, we, we do envision that this data team work could actually focus not just on students who are struggling but on the student body at large, K-12, to develop those skills that uh, the vast majority of our students really need to develop. It's really exciting work, great time to be uh, an educator right now. Wonderful, thank you. Questions? I guess I have a question about the planning for the future where I, because I didn't see anything about the cloud and that yeah. seems to be where, where people are moving. Um, you know, we've heard Maria talk about uh, the high school using Google Docs and so forth, but I didn't really, really see a strong theme in that direction. Um, well, there's, um, I think Google Apps is in there. It, it, Google Apps, the expansion of Google Apps into Middlebrook is part of the plan. Um, Can you talk about Google Apps? Uh, uh, about Google, that for Google Apps uh, right now we're piloting at the high school and it's, um, it's a way of um, allowing you to um, have a little bit of control. You can actually bring in and manage a section of students, in this case high school students, and their accounts, so their accounts and their logins match their logins to our network um, and it gives them a, an email account that is branded so it doesn't say at Google or at Gmail it says at WiltonHS.org um, I think and uh, it also gives the full suite of Google applications so they can have shared documents they can um, any of the Google tools that if you go to Google and use if you're a Google user um, the beauty of that is the storage, when they work on those documents, they don't have to store them on a flash drive or on, our, on their storage on our server. They're stored out in Google. Um, the, um, and the other thing about that is it's, it's platform neutral. So if it, one kid's got a Mac at home and one kid's got a brand new Windows 7 machine and another kid's got a a little old Acer uh, netbook, it doesn't matter. There, even if you have a, an, an iPad, there, you can edit that document. You can all work on the same document. Um, we did talk infrastructurally. We did have discussions about virtualization and about storage to the cloud. But right now, I can't see the cost coming down enough to make it uh, a big affordable thing for us so uh, and my staff really um, I don't want to say they're control freaks but they they like to have the data and the actual um, especially with student data they like to really be able to protect that and have it in-house um, it's not to say that we did not have that discussion though it just um, the cost savings aren't that vast for what we might give up if we lost our data and that and uh, you know, with, with student data, we're very protective of, and personnel data and things like that, we're, we're very protective of it. I also had a question about planning for the future. Are there other, are there things that you would have included in the plan if cost was not an issue? Yeah, 
I, I don't think so. You know, I, I, the, the, the big piece, you know, cost-wise is, um, and it's been in since we've had a tech plan, so this will be 12 years in a row, is actually a personnel. We would like to have, uh, they used to call them tech integrators. Now it's in vogue to call them tech coaches, like a literacy coach. But to have um, someone who's not teaching full-time and not having to worry about their classroom of <coughs> fourth graders, but someone who could go out and co-teach and model best practices and also help evaluate our tech program. Um, it, it, it's something that many of our comparison schools are, have had for many years. We don't have that, um, but we keep putting it in. You remember I said uh, we, we feel it's the right thing to keep putting it in. Um, I don't know when the budget year will come and we'll feel compelled to ask for that, but we certainly have uh, have thought of that, um, but in terms of you know equipment or things that we're planning for, um, we did not um, leave anything on the table. Could you read the vision statement? I think it's very good. Absolutely. Wilton Public Schools provides a technological environment where both students and staff benefit from a seamless integration of technology to support their learning and work. The Wilton Public Schools ensure that all students and staff members possess, possess the competencies to communicate, adapt, contribute responsibly, and excel in an increasingly technologically based global community. That's excellent. Now, the question, um, it really doesn't focus on infrastructure, and I've always been interested in that, and I know we still have a problem with the, the closets for the switches at Cider Mill and, and uh, Miller Driscoll. Is there a plan for getting those uh, sort of under control? Um, yes. Um, we're um, actually meeting um, tomorrow. We actually have a meeting with our network, um, our network engineers meeting with some engineering specialists to talk about um, our, con just like, just like uh, computers and our servers, we cycle our equipment. And it's hard to believe that our equipment now is at a point where we're going to need to cycle it out, that equipment that was roasting years ago. Um, so we're actually setting up a plan for that as part of the plan. Now, I was sort of hoping, and again, this is perhaps my folly, that we would have a building <laughs> plan for Miller Driscoll ready, and that, that would be included as part of the building. <laughs> that would be part of the building project there, because I'm reluctant to invest a lot of money. They do, ha they do have air handlers, so the air does circulate there, so that's not as critical. And um, Cider Mill, because of the the general cool nature of the air conditioning there and the proximity to the library, isn't as bad as, you know, we already addressed the really bad ones. Of course, I would love to um, address all of this, but we're, we are having a meeting tomorrow and we're headed that way. But the, the, the plan didn't lend itself to that. You know, the, the plan, they changed the goals around a little bit, and um, it, I, I guess they they wanted to make make it match the national the, the national technology yeah. plan. So, so we're not at you don't think we're really at risk of you know, what we had sort of a meltdown. No, <laughs> no. The uh, our our infrastructure is solid and sound. Um, we are hoping, of course, um, to that the town goes through with the bonding project for our fiber because that would allow us to have a optimal optimal backup which we're not able to afford right now um, and that would really open some doors for us in terms of our ability to not only back ourselves up but to back up the town and the library so it's uh, pretty exciting stuff and I believe there will be information if the public wants to learn about it at the Tech Expo. So there'll be a table there. I'm sorry, when is this? <laughs> <laughs> Did you say March 29, 530 Middlebrook? Yes. What's amazing is to watch what's happening. I'm thinking about my experience as high school principal for seven years, and I don't have the formal data, but it'd be interesting to track the number of times that I would have had to go on, uh, on the PA to announce our technology was mm -hmm. down. <laughs> and early on in my principalship, it was quite often. <laughs> and towards the end, and now, uh, of course, with Bob at the helm, it, that it happens rarely. But interestingly, when it does happen, 
it's amazing how the whole machinery just comes to a halt and you know we have to re resort to other approaches you know to keep student learning moving forward but all in all we're, I think we have a relatively uh, good track record here recently of maintaining our infrastructure and mm -hmm. keeping the, the ship running if you will do you, do you think sound fields will progress the same way that smart boards have I'm hoping uh, sound fields and uh, again I'm hoping that Miller Driscoll will actually have a better um, heating ventilation system as it gets rebuilt. Um, but I do see I do see we're going to continue moving those forward because it really is the right thing for the learning environment. You know, if if you're if you walk in, I walk into a lot of classrooms and when you hear the teachers on them, it's 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 almost takes your breath away that you can have your back to the teacher and it sounds like they're right in front of you um, and you can see that the kids it don't even re after a week or so don't even recognize it they're just used to hearing their teacher maybe they want to not hear their teacher um, all the time but um, it's very clear um, and document cameras are another one that it's one of those ones that I think until people had recognized how powerful it is to be able to take student work and share it with everybody and instantly do the work, especially in couple with the smart board. Um, it was one of those ones that people didn't know about it, but then all of a sudden they saw their neighbor have it and then uh, the, the interest sparked very quickly. The sound fields and the document cameras, will they be demonstrated at the Tech Expo? Um, Sound fields well that okay. because it's because partially because of where it is it's a, it's in Middlebrook and okay. the, those rooms that have the sound fields will be. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if document cameras. I have to. I have haven't got the final um, presenters list okay. finalized, but um, I could make that happen. I think it would be a good idea. It, it, it might be worthwhile. It might right. make sense. I'd like to looking forward to hearing the sound field thing. Yeah. Here, yeah. Seeing yeah. that yeah. demonstrate it. So. Yeah. The most dramatic impact of the sound field that I saw is when a teacher is writing on the board and therefore has their back to the students. Mm -hmm. They don't run the risk of losing a student at the, at the back mm -hmm. of the classroom. The student can. <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions? Yeah, te technically, what's being. How would you distinguish the technology that's being put into the classroom and that that's being used in the media centers and the libraries? And is the need for a lot of leading question, but is, it, is the uh, need for a library or, uh, uh, <laughs> and, me, and, liber and um, media centers, is that is the need for that sort of going away? Uh, no. You know, the media center, you know, the, the, our media center is becoming a hub for student learning and the hub for activity um, around information, um, especially here. If you're here, this building is buzzing during the day, mm -hmm. and student, the, every computer is routinely used. Uh, teachers are booking the mezzanine lab with classes. They're, if, if, you know, if there's a big class because of the class size, they, they'll, um, they have uh, netbooks that they'll connect wirelessly up there to get to the databases. So um, you need the technology here. now. You know, in an ideal world, I would love to have um, some of that equipment so that teachers in their off periods can have time to use it. But right now, the teachers really have have to take their time and learn, you know, take classes or, or, or learn after school or before school. But it would be nice to have a maybe the media center have some of that equipment where a teacher could come in and, uh, and really get an opportunity to, to sandbox a little bit. What day next week is the tech <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's the 29th. I could be mistaken. What Thursday, Thursday, I think. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be a Thursday at 5:30 in Middlebrook. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful job. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, there are no action items on our agenda for this evening. Uh, future business. The timeline is on the Board of Ed website. If anybody has a question, any questions, please go to the Board of Ed website to look for that. Again, next Monday, March 26th, in the Middlebrook Auditorium, we will be presenting the Board of Ed budget to the town, and that is at 7.30 p.m. If anybody has any questions on the budget, please go to the district website. The entire budget is, is up there, line item by line item. Um, as you know, it's, we're currently proposing a 2% increase over last year. Um, at this point, end of the meeting, uh, we also open it up to public comment, if there are any.
Are there any members of the comment that would any members of the comment that would like to public? <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> you know, I don't think I could repeat that. Not seeing any, I'd like to remind people that they can contact us via email on the Board of Ed website. And uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.